Good morning. Good morning. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our opening hymn, number 241, In the Bleak Midwinter. We'll sing all the verses. Please hear our opening words written by Reverend Gretchen Haley. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? In these days, we find ourselves too often stuck with these questions on repeat. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? We grasp at signs and markers, articles of news and analysis, Facebook memes and forwarded emails, as if the new zodiac is capable of forecasting all that life may yet bring our way, as if we could prepare, as if life had ever made any promises of making sense or turning out the way we thought as if we are not also actors in this still unfolding story. For this hour, we gather to surrender to the mystery, to release ourselves from the needing to know, the yearning to have it all figured out already, and also the burden of believing we either have all of the control or none. Here in our song, in our silence, our stories and our sharing, we make space for a new breath, a new healing, a new possibility to take root. That is courage, forged in the fire of our coming together and felt by the spirit that comes alive in this act of faith. That we believe still a new world is possible, that we are creating it already here and now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Hannah Laura Chapel, and I will be your youth worship leader this morning. Welcome to Buckman Bridge Unitarian Universalist Church, or as we like to conveniently abbreviate it, BBUUC. We are so delighted to have you with us. 
We as Unitarian Universalists live by our seven principles, which can be found in the back of your order of service. We encourage questions, we encourage exploration, and we encourage change. We meet together in this sacred space every Sunday to share our beliefs so that we may learn together, so that we may find our own truths. No matter your age, race, gender, or sexuality, you are welcome here. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome any first time visitors or returning guests with us this morning. We hope that you feel welcome and that you would like to get to know us. We invite you to grab a name tag so that we may get to know you by name. These can be found at our welcome table by the entryway. While you're there, feel free to pick up some information about our church and our denomination. We also offer regular Learn About Us classes for those who want to learn more about our congregation or about Unitarian Universalism. After the service, we invite our members to join us in the back of the sanctuary for coffee, snacks, and conversations. I now ask that all of you please silence your electronic devices for a de distraction-free service. Thank you. We light our chalice each Sunday morning as a symbol of our faith. I'd like to invite Cindy Jorgensen up to illuminate our chalice. Our chalice words today were written by Reverend K. Karen Johnston. Life is a series of circles and transitions, some known, some mysterious. Transitions are like doorways. When we open a door, we think we know what we will find on the other side, but we can never be sure. So as we gather together today for worship, let us open to the mystery, the mystery, the riddle, and the mystery. And today is the third Sunday of Advent. In previous services, we lit the first Advent candle for hope and the second Advent candle for peace. In a moment, we will light the third candle for joy. The four candles on this wreath count down through the season of winter's dark leading into the light. Advent is a season of waiting, of expectation, and of longing. On the third Sunday of Advent, we now light one more candle on our wreath, which represents joy. How is it, you might wonder, that we should celebrate joy when there's so much suffering in the world. Isn't that contradictory? It's an exercise of faith to address the unknown, which can also be called the not yet known. Advent is a season of watchfulness. We listen and keep vigil for the promise of things to come. We speak and sing about the promise of the not yet manifest as reflected in the words of familiar hymns, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. People look east, the time is near, love, the guest, is on the way. There's a star in the east, it will lead you. These are the songs of the hopeful, songs of faith. These hymns encourage us to enter and consent to the practice of opening to possibility. Joy is one of the qualities which, if not yet present within us, will come to us in its own time. This light of joy, then, does not require that you experience joy this moment in your immediate surroundings. Instead, it is a reminder to wait for it with faithfulness that overshadows pain and cynicism. May the lighting of this candle bring us patience, grant us faith, draw us closer to joy.
please remain seated and join me in reciting our Congregational Covenant, which you will find printed in your order of service. We covenant to engage one another with honesty, kindness, and respect, to value diversity, seek understanding of our differences, and practice gracious accountability with care, love, and empathy. We make these promises to those who are here and those yet to come so that we may be a safe, welcoming, and beloved community of acceptance, learning, and transformation. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our call to worship. The words are printed in your order of service. and Mary Avery are beloved members of this congregation. They both sing beautifully and we are fortunate to have them sing for us this morning. Uh, I confess I've been looking forward to it since it was first announced that they would sing. You can read more about them in the order of service. Welcome Mary and Eileen.
In the season of light, mystery, and wonder, there are many stories to tell from many faith traditions. Today we're going to explore two tales from the Christian holiday of Christmas. The first will be about an angel and the shepherds. I invite all of our shepherds, sheep, any other random cattle to the chancel, and I would like um, the angels to come over here, please. Come on up. And the star. Awesome. A lot of stories and Christmas carols talk about the lowly shepherd. Lowly means beneath. Now why do they say lowly shepherd? Back when Christ was born, people looked down at shepherds. Many people didn't think shepherds were important people. We know that this goes directly against our Unitarian Universalist principle that says every person is important and worthy of our compassion and respect. So to our story, I ask our star to light up the sky. Need to give the star a little bit of room. Awesome. It was one of the longest nights of the year, and the shepherds who spend all night outside with their flock saw a huge star in the sky. Imagine their astonishment. Can I see some astonishment? There we go. What a mystery. What did this mean? Well, if that wasn't enough, God sent down an angel from heaven, and the angel appeared before the shepherds. Brooke, just in front. And with that, the shepherds kind of freaked out. But the angel said, don't be afraid. I have great news for you and for everyone in the world. And here's what the angel said. A baby was born today in the manger, in a manger in the city of David, which is another name for Bethlehem. And this is an amazing thing. And we shall call him Christ the Lord. Now I now invite the rest of our angelic companions up on either side of Brooke. And then suddenly there was with the first angel a multitude of the heavenly host. I had to look that one up. A heavenly host is actually translates to be kind of a peaceful army of angels. And they appeared in the sky and in my mind there was a lot of light, a lot of music, and they said, glory to God, which basically means yay God because they are celebrating Jesus' birth. And just as importantly, the angels say, let there be peace on earth, and may we love one another. I'm glad that we have a sheep that's in character, giving us kind of the ambience of what it's like out there on the plains. And with this invitation from the shepherd, from the angels, the shepherds went to find the baby Jesus in Bethlehem, and they bowed down before him. Now you have to admit, this is a heck of a birth announcement. You got lambs, you got stars, you got a heavenly host, and I think in this story, God and the angel he sent got it right in making this announcement to the lowly shepherds. Not to rich businessmen, not to politicians or important people. Well, three kings found out, but they didn't get the angel, so that's okay. The message behind the message was that Jesus would recognize the inherent worth and dignity of every person, including our lowly shepherds. And then that, that is a great message to include in a birth announcement of the man who would become the center of the Christian religion and who we all may consider 
to have been a remarkable teacher and symbol of love. Would you all like to take a bow? You may be seated. We take an offering each Sunday so that we can live out our values by supporting the mission and the work of this church. You will find alternative methods for giving in the order of service and on our website. However you choose to give, we ask that you participate in this ritual this morning by taking the plate and passing it to your neighbor. Our offertory ushers, Helen Met and Ted Clisby, will please come forward to receive the offering. When they have finished, I will invite you to rise in body or spirit to sing our offertory hymn, number 123, Spirit of Life.
other up. It was a clear, crisp night in the, in the desert, but the wind was whipping through the cold desert winter. The night was full of wonder and magic. Amal the shepherd boy was perched on a rock, playing his flute softly, as he did on many nights. The immense sky overhead was dark and deep like black velvet, pierced through by a multitude of stars. But of all the stars in the heavens, one star rang true and bright. Amal had been gazing at this bright, large star for 11 nights now. What great mystery is this, he wondered. About two weeks ago, it was the longest night of the year, and shortly after that, the star had appeared blazing high in the sky with a tail that seemed to be on fire. Amal's mother poked her head out of the doorway and called out, Amal, Amal, this is the last time. Come inside. It's far too cold for you to sit out here. Amal had spent hours sitting on this rock, and he was unable to walk without the use of a crutch. He was born with a leg that did not function as it should but the use of his leg was getting harder and harder. But on this night, he thought not of his leg or his crutch or his mother's and his predicament. He was mesmerized by the star. What was keeping you outside, Amal, said his mother. The sky, mother, such a sky. Hanging over our roof, there is a star as large as a window, and a star had a tail that was this big. It was, had been moving across the sky like a chariot on fire, but now it has stopped, and it blazes brighter than ever. How big was the tail? asked his mother. It was this big. When were you stopping to stop telling tales, she asked. Okay, maybe it was just this big. You see, Amal had never traveled very far away from his home, but Amal liked to make up wondrous stories from his imagination. Mother, truly, I'm not lying, replied Amal. His mother said, here we are with nothing to eat, not a stick of wood in the fire, not a drop of oil in the jug, and you worry me with your fairy tales? First it was a leopard with a woman's head, and then it was a cat with wings and horns. But there is a star, there is, and I'm sure it means something, Mother. I just can't figure out what that might be. His mother responded, oh, poor Amal. Hunger has gone to your head. What is a poor widow to do with her cupboard when her cupboards and pockets are empty? She looked at him quite concerned. I worry you are getting weaker. I worry that we have to move to the city and start begging, the both of us. My poor son, a beggar. She began to cry. She feared for her son's future if they had to beg on the streets. Oh, don't cry, mother, said Amal. If we must go begging, a good beggar I will be. I know sweet tunes on my flute that will set people dancing. You can sing with your beautiful voice and will walk through the villages and towns and the coins will rain down from the open windows above. At the end of the day, we will stop for dinner and eat goose and sweet almonds. The mother sighed and replied softly, We're wasting our lamp oil. Good night, Amal. And they both lied down on their straw beds. Amal whispers in the dark, yawning, oh, And after the goose dinner, we will sleep under the stars with our new flock of sheep and... Amal went silent. Good night, my dreamer. Good night, said his mother. And she too fell asleep. 
Now, Amal was not the only one to have seen the star. There was a small band of travelers from the east just entering Amal's village. I welcome Mary Avery and Eileen Morrison back up to the chancel. who had just entered the town had been journeying miles and miles on foot, following the star for 11 days now. They were tired and cold and hungry and simply could not go on without rest. As they passed by Amal's house, they stopped and knocked on the door. Amal and his mother rolled over on their beds. Amal, said his mother, would you please go and see who's at the door? It is probably that crazy neighbor again mistaking our house for his. Amal got up and opened the door and peered out and his jaw dropped open. He slammed the door and scrambled back to his mother. Mother, mother, I need you to see this. What's all the fuss, Amal? Who is it? Mother, outside the door there are three kings with crowns. Oh, Amal, again with a 
his stories, groaned his mother as she reached for her wrap. Tell the neighbor he has the wrong house again and tell him to please lay off their wine, his wine. And he made, they made their way back to the door and swung the door open. Good evening, said the night visitors in unison as they made courtly bows. Well, Amal and his mother, both thoroughly flummoxed, responded with rather uncourtly bows and curtsies or bows and, oh, they were very confused. Excuse me, madam, but may we rest a while in your home and warm ourselves by the fireplace? Amal's mother replied sheepishly, I'm a poor widow. I'm afraid our fireplace is cold and a bed of straw is all we have to offer. But to these, you are welcome. Amal and his mother looked them, the three travelers, up and down. They were adorned in regal fashion of brocade garments with gold stitching and then they invited their night visitors in. The three stately gentlemen were followed by their page and assistant, and as they, walked into the, as they walked into the small home, Amal's mother went to get firewood, and Amal asked his guests to sit, and Amal had never seen anyone dressed like this before. And he had a million questions for them. They told them all that they were kings from distant lands. Their names were Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. They had been traveling westward bearing gifts to bring a new king, a baby just born 11 days before. 11 days, said Amal. Why, that's how long I've been seeing the star. The wise men smiled knowingly. Balthazar said, yes, the star, we've been following the star. Are you really kings, Melchior replied? We are high priests, they call us magi, and yes, we are considered kings in the land from which we come. But we are servants to the king who we are seeking, for he is the king for he is the king of kings. What do you carry, Cas What do you carry? Well, Caspar replied, we carry many gifts, including frankincense, a special incense used for holy occasions, and we bring myrrh to anoint the babe. And is that truly gold? Balthazar replied. Yes, we bring gold befitting a king of his stature. Amazed at the wealth of riches, Amal asked, Do you carry anything that might cure my leg? The wise men with all their wisdom looked down and said, Alas, no, Amal. If we had something that would cure your leg, we would certainly share it. The kings then asked Amal all about himself. Amal told them of their troubles. After the drought, we sold our flock of sheep and what was left of them, that money went to pay the horrible taxes. He told them that his mother had been so upset that they might have to resort to begging to make enough money to eat. But he also said that he might be able to play his flute and make enough money to buy sheep that he and his mother could raise. But the wise men looked at themselves, knowing that was unlikely and that sheep were very expensive. The mother returned with wood for the fire and bread that she had borrowed from a neighbor. The wise men's page helped to make the fire and they all ate the bread. Amal played his flute and all the kings enjoyed the music immensely, stamping their hands and clapping their feet. I mean, stamping their feet and clapping their hands. <laughs> Eventually, all, they all decided it was time to rest, and they fell asleep. 
That is, everyone except Amal's mother. She lay awake for hours, watching the wise men's page sleeping next to the gold. She thought that she thought that what just what would just a little bit of that gold could do for her son. She could keep her son from being hungry and cold. Perhaps then her son could get stronger. I mean, perhaps the wise men could not miss it if she took just a little bit of the gold and she hesitantly reached out for it and the thief and the page woke up and cried, thief, thief, she is stealing the gold. And they started wrestling over the gold. Amal woke up and started beating the page. Let go of my mother, let go of my mother. Take your hands off of her. The three wise men stood up in consternation. The mother let go of the gold and it fell to the floor. She knelt sobbing at the feet of the kings. She pleaded with the wise men that she was not stealing for herself, but rather for Amal. She was afraid of the consequences of having stolen the, the gold from the new king. Caspar smiled and turned to Melchior and Balthazar and said, come friends, it is time we are on our way. Amal's mother yelped, wait, what about your gold? as she scooped up the gold that has spilled on the floor. Balthazar responded with warmth in his eyes, Dear woman, you may know you may have that gold. The child does we seek doesn't need the gold. He will build a kingdom on love alone. His hands will not hold a scepter. His head will not wear a crown. This king will bring us new life and the keys to the kingdom belong to the poor. And with that, the kings began to gather their gifts. Amal's mother called out, but wait, good sirs, I've waited my whole life for such a king. If I were, weren't so poor, I'd send a gift of my own to such a child. But as you can see, I have nothing to give. Pick up that gold. So Amal looked around and then down at his crutch. Please, my wise men, this is the only thing I own, my crutch. I made it myself. Let me give my crutch to the child. It is a good crutch and who knows, he may need one. With that, Amal hesitantly took a step forward. And then he took another step and Amal's eyes were widened. With no difficulty, he was walking. <laughs> he walks, he walks, shouted the mother and page and wise men with glee. I can not only walk, look, I can dance and run and skip, laughed Amal as he was skipping around the room. Melchior explained, exclaimed, it is a gift from the Holy Child. We must praise him. Amal paused from his skipping and hopping and looked at his mother solemnly. Mother, I have the strangest feeling. I mean, besides feeling well and whole, mother, I must go and thank the king for the gift. I must, mother, I must, and I will bring him my gift in person. Well, Amal's mother was quite worried about the idea of Amal joining the wise men to follow the star. She said, but we're not even sure how far it will be. But Amal, you're not strong enough. But the nights will be too cold for my son to be out. Balthazar assured her, good woman, we will look after Amal. He can ride on our camel if he tires. We will keep warm. Is the camel ready? 
Amal's mother knew she didn't have a lot of time and agreeing, she helped Amal gather a few things and they followed the wise men and Amal followed the wise men and the page out the door. They all looked up and were reassured as the sun had not yet risen and the star, the beacon of all that was love, was still in the west. Amal's mother wept as she waved goodbye to Amal. Amal's running away. <laughs> she waved goodbye to Amal and the night, and the night visitors as they proceeded at a stately pace towards Bethlehem. <laughs> the end. Good job, you guys. As the kids make their way back to their seats, I invite you all to rise and sing our closing hymn, number 237, the first Noel. We will sing all three verses. As Cindy Jorgensen returns to extinguish the flames and then the chalice, please hear the words of Robin Gray. The flame is extinguished, but not our hope for the future, our courage in the face of crisis, or the love we share in all the world. Blessed be and amen. <laughs>